win this. But first, we discover the Mawari horses of Rajasthan. Rajasthan, India, is home to the Mawari horse and to the family of Raghuvendra Singh Dunlod, known to all as Bonnie. Our family has been here since the time this area got its name as, uh, as uh, Shekhawati. Uh, we originally come from the Jaipur uh, family. We branch out from the Jaipur royal family. It was one of our ancestors who at one stage at Amir told his elder brother that you will always be a ruler, you will be a Maharaja, what about me? And the Maharaja just turned around and he said, well, if you are that keen, go find yourself a kingdom. Rao Shekha was the one who actually established the rule in this um, area. And from there, our clan took the name of Shekhawat, from Rao Shekha and then the area Shekhawati. Bonnie's ancestral home is the 18th century fort in the village of Dunlad. It was the fifth son of Rao Shekha, uh, Kesri Singh, who built this fort in 1750. And of course, since the period that it was made has been in our, in our family right through. The Marwadi horse comes from Marwad. Marwad is the region which is more west from here, uh, which is popularly at the today's time known as the Jodhpur state. And the word Marwad meant the land of death. It was the land was so harsh uh, in those areas, uh, in those times, the desert and the warfares which took place. The Rathor rulers were known to have challenged the Mughal rulers and a lot of battles were, were fought. And from that time onwards, the horse became the Marwadi horse because he was usually uh, bred in that area and he was bred for battle. In India, we have four or five indigenous breeds. Most of them exist in the hilly areas of Kashmir, Manipur, and they, they originate from the Mughal, pre-Mughal times, from the Mongolian period when Chinggis Khan visited uh, India and invaded India in, in those periods. Whereas these horses, which is the Marwadi, we consider them as, as original horses from the land in India, from the land in Rajasthan actually bred for battle horses. The entire training was done of that kind, their, their stamina, their endurance, their uh, everything uh, from the battle maneuvers was taught to this horse from the very young age. They were actually bred for that. Desert war horses would generate clouds of sand and dust as they maneuvered across country. I think one of the reasons environmentally which comes from the rising of the dust and everything is that inward pointed ears which is the most unique feature of this horse now that kind of feature does not exist and as far as we know in any other breed of horses the inward layer shaped ears not only that they're inward but this is one breed of horses who can move their ears nearly 180 degrees you know, they are facing this way and they can both face this way and not only both at a time, most of the time they can be one way, one ear facing this way and one ear facing this way. And we find the horse is very attentive because of this unique feature, uh, attentive to sound and people in the army, when the battles were there, they would watch the horses to find out if there was another cavalry close by or another movement close by, by the attentiveness of the horse told them there was something there which they had to be aware of. The Mawari horse is still firmly embedded in the social culture of the region. Basically, of course, when, when you think of Hindu religion, the cow is one of the most religious animals and it's connected to the gods. And, uh, but the horse is divine and the horse is absolutely a part and parcel of most of the gods, their activities, temples, religion-wise, religion as well as in today's time even, the horse is the most important animal to be used for a wedding ceremony. The weddings in India cannot take place unless and until the bridegroom is not riding a mare to the girl's house for the ceremony and which still exists whatever caste you, you come from. Horses were considered to be 
either for the kings, warriors, or for the very high class. But now things, of course, ha have, have changed. And therefore, you will find their uh, statues in temples. You will find them with gods. You will find them on wall paintings. You will find all the warriors. Majority of the warriors will be shown with their horse. Even with such an auspicious history, the Mawari horse is almost never found outside India. It was during the British India that the horse lost its position. And therefore, the British also realized that the horse was a symbol of royalty and the symbol of power. And to eradicate that, they influenced the Indian rulers and Maharajas that this horse is a bit wild, it's too temperamentally, it's, it's too energetically, it's too fast and it's not suitable for ladies. This horse moved out of the palaces and the royal estate and went to the saises, the grooms to look after and the grooms took them to their farms. So we, we basically lost that, that confirmation or the look of the horse because those people could not maintain it at that level. Then when we come to 1947, India gets independent. Unfortunately, the new government which comes in also looks at the horse as part of royalty. And their schemes have always been, okay, we have to do everything anti the rulers, anti royals. It is only in the last eight, nine years since we people realized that, you know, we, we have this horse and we ought to do something about it, that we all formed the Indigenous Horse Society of India, emphasized to the government the need to protect and to upgrade the breeding of these horses, that things have, have changed. It is only in the early 80s that a concept of tourism came into Rajasthan and that is when heritage tourism came into existence. And a lot of fort and palaces like Dunlo and a lot of others uh, started converting their homes into heritage hotels. And because they were being converted, the entire culture connected, or the activities connected with those properties which used to exist in the pre-independence days came back into uh, uh, living you know, enacting them or living like that because people who came and stayed with you would like to see what it was in those days. And therefore the horse somehow fitted that thing. And what was important was that we started taking people out for riding. So when guests came and stayed with us, you know, we said, would you like to go out in the countryside? Would you like to ride? And they said, yes. So we took our horses and went out. That is how I started taking some of my horses into safaris and learning from the foreigners who came here, seeing their interest in the horse, seeing what they told us about the horses because they had the experience of seeing various breeds all over the world, did we realize that we were actually with a, a gem. And that is when we started taking interest in it. That is when we realized that, well, here is something which we had lost, but we should maybe get it back to its uh, uh, lost glory. And that is when the breeding started, the plans started of trying to breed them well, look after them, use them for safaris, trying to get them exported out of the country. And that is how the whole thing started. So it is due to tourism that it became an important factor and brought back the, the horse to, to its uh, lost glory. Success in equestrian sport would be one way of adding to that glory. Because we were doing the rides in the desert areas, in the sand areas, we were doing about 40, 50 kilometers a day, sometimes with really very tall, heavy riders, and the horse looks much smaller, leaner, compared to thoroughbred horses. But yet, we realized that the horse was able to take the weight and do the long distances and was not tired. Our riders used to tell us after a day, they felt that the horse will calm down, you know, they'll be more relaxed. They found that every day, the horse was as fresh as it was in the beginning. In fact, he was more keen to keep going than what it was in the beginning. But that gave us the idea that if we train them, we put them into endurance, we will be able to make this an endurance horse. And the Marwadi horses, our team from Dunlod, uh, representing Rajasthan in both the nationals, has got the gold medal as a team for 100 kilometers and, and the individual medals first and the third have come to us on, on the Marwadi horse. For Bonnie, there is still work to do to ensure the Mawari's future. I would not say that it is very secure. We 
want to make it much more secure than what where we have reached and I think we, we can only achieve that once we have more of our horses abroad for people to see, to compete in competitions. Uh, again, I would say apart from endurance, uh, tent pegging is, is a very important sport because it's a warlike sport. The horse is very suitable for that. Because these horses dance, dressage could be another one where these horses could prove uh, a lot. So till we are able to prove that, we are a bit insecure. So we are again talking to the government to say they should allow a limited amount of number of horses to go out, uh, especially if they can go into various sports to prove what they are worth. If they are able to do that, our future is secure.